this uh, our next guest threw the name out. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I He's saw that. All-star. Yeah, yeah man. <laughs> Our guest in this segment is none other than Mr. David Valente, former state chairman of the Libertarian Party in West Virginia. Now he's, I don't know what he is. He's just one of those guys that... Uh, the GDI. He's a GDI, I guess, yeah, right? GDI. Just an independent and proud of it. Uh, good morning, sir. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Uh, I think the last check was that I was uh, doing better than average. Good stuff. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of day left today. <laughs> <laughs> it could go either way at this point. I don't know. In studio with John... Uh, um, um, Gilstrap, whose last name I nearly forgot there a moment ago because I always say <laughs> New York Times. That happens a lot, actually. You know what I didn't do? I did say New York Times bestselling there author first. You so. forgot my first name. I forgot <laughs> the ramp up. And the New York Times bestselling author is your first name. John's the middle to me, so I messed up my order there. And Matt Miller, the Hall of Famer as well. Uh, so we wanted to get into the Middle East with David because he's got quite the concentration of studies uh, in, in the region and uh, knows as much about Iraq, uh, Iran as, as most people that I know, uh, by the way. If you could, uh, David, give us the quick resume to establish your bona fides. Uh, so, I mean, I've been studying Iran for uh, probably 15, 20 years now. Um, I have an uh, international affairs degree from Kennesaw State University, uh, degree in diplomacy from Norwich University. Um, studied under many Iranian experts, uh, including a guy who went to Iran uh, back in two, uh, the late 90s when they accidentally elected a reformer. Um, there was some normalization between the United States and Iran. Um, the State Department did a academic exchange where some Iranian professors came over to the United States, and he went over to Iran and spent a year in Iran. Um, living amongst the people, going to the university there, it was he, you know, it was a, a fascinating um, look into the culture of Iran, um, and and how Iranians, and and I've seen this on on multiple you know travel logs and things like that, where you know how Iranians view in the United States, um, it's not the view of the government. The government thinks of the United States as great Satan because they are, you know, a theocratic institution. Um, average Iranians, you know, really just want peace, and because peace will bring normalization, will bring uh, betterment to their economy, bring you know humanitarian aid, things like that. Um, and and generally, people in the Middle East are very hosp- hospitable people. So when mm-hmm. you're confronted with foreigners, they they really um, warm up to them and, and offer them kind of the world. So, um, but you know. I've been studying, it's not just uh, current Iranian affairs, although, you know, growing up with the Iran hostage uh, Mm -hmm. situation in in the late 80s or the early 80s, um, the, you know, the fall of the Shah and all that stuff, um, you know, it was kind of like my first foray into, you know, world affairs. And uh, and it's left an impression on me. And I, you know, I've I've studied the Safavids and uh, Sassanids and, and, you know, the Persians, and yeah, well, it's been a long let's, journey. Let's jump into it then and, and talk about the situation currently in the Middle East with mm-hmm. Israel, Palestine, Hamas, and Iran's role in all of this because most of us suspect that it is Iran that is going to be supplying a lot of munitions and fueling a lot of uh, the undercurrent uh, that's going on here, what could quickly become a, a multi front war. Sure, and that's, you know, that's been threatened uh, quite a bit. Uh, Ibrahim Raisi, the uh, current president of Iran, has mentioned that uh, we could be seeing a multi-front war. Um, remember, Israel is surrounded not just by hostile neighbors, and I, I'd say hostile is a little bit of an overstatement. I don't think the Jordanians and the, the Lebanese are all that hostile towards Israel, but they have significant pol- uh, populations, primarily of Palestinians, that uh, are not really keen on, on Israel for, for historical reasons. Um, you know, Egypt's got a, uh, a peace treaty with with the uh, Israelis, so uh, you know they're they've been slow to open the border there uh, with Gaza. But um, you know, when it comes to Hamas, I think a lot of people are are just saying, well, because Iran does not like Israel, and they have funded Hamas, that Hamas is their their horse in this. Um, and to an extent, yes, they they're they're the ones who made the attack. Um, who are game to making the attack? Um, what there are, there are some things at play here. I, if Iran had its druthers, it would be Hezbollah doing the atta- attacking. Hezbollah is a Shiite military force, 
that is aligned with the particular branch of religion that Iran espouses, the Shiite uh, branch of Islam. Uh, Hamas is a Sunni, uh, born out of the Muslim Brotherhood that was born out of Egypt. Um, so there, there is, they consider Hamas part of the the Islamic resistance to Israel, which entitles them to funding and support and logistics and things like that. Things that you would need to make an attack like they did on mm-hmm. on Israel, especially the logistics. But especially, I mean as targeted as those attack. Now, you know, it's it's not to say that there's no way that Gaza, that, that Hamas could have planned these attacks themselves, but the level of precision, there were, there were some outside influence here. Um, and the uh, decision to go ahead and attack now, uh, there is some outside influence here. Although I don't think it's Iran alone. Um, oh, who else? So I'll, I'll ask, you know, um, Larry's not here today, but I'll ask some leading questions. Which country do you think would benefit the most out of a divided Europe versus America versus America when it comes to Israel? Russia. Which country would stand to benefit from a divided U.S. budget going to uh, foreign conflicts? Russia. Which country would stand to benefit um, from from having the world's focus taken off its own external conflict? Russia. Absolutely. Um, Russia would stand to benefit the most out of this, this conflict. By the uh, way, note, uh, Mr. Gilstrap, I got 100% on that quiz. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> Absolutely. I you, saw that. You were shirking in the back of the room, hoping Crushed the professor it. wouldn't call on you. I well, no, no, no. I, was, I, I, I thought I he was going to go around the room. <laughs> I, I had a sense early what the right answer was. <laughs> you, were, you were raising your hand for the hall pass. I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean— it, Russia stands the most to gain out of this this conflict, and you know there's no coincidence that yesterday President Raisi was meeting with uh, President Erdogan of Turkey and Vladimir Putin um, to discuss what's going on there. Um, uh, Russia has also been running cover in the United uh, UN Security Council for you know putting out resolutions about this uh, conflict without mentioning Hamas by name. Um, so there is something there, um, and there is a benefit to Russia, a great benefit to Russia. Russia, is, Russia probably makes more sense in the, the level of sophistication of this attack um, versus Iran. Iran would have just sent guys over the border to, to attack and then, then sent them back, uh, not the hostages, not that. The level of, of coordination, the level of logistics, to me, more important – points to Russia. Um, now, did they go through Iran? Probably, because Iran has the contacts on the ground. Um, but, you know, Russia has also had historical ties to Palestinian, uh, both the PLO, uh, Fatah, uh, who control the West Bank, and, and Hamas, So, um, and probably have less of an ideological issue dealing with, with Hamas than Iran does. So, um, yeah, I... I kind of lay a lot of this down at the feet of Russia. But isn't that fundamentally a distraction when we've got, in my mind, I'm I'm kind of simplistic about this. I I write books, so I got good guys and bad guys. So Mm -hmm. I I sort of have Hamas equals Hezbollah equals ISIS uh, to a lesser degree equals Al-Qaeda. They have all pledged to destroy Israel Mm -hmm. and by extension to destroy Judaism. So it seems to me that by getting distracted over who's funding the human weapon system, which is Hamas and Hezbollah and ISIS, <clears throat> if we just destroy, Israel is concentrating on destroying the weapon system, which is Hamas and, and ISIS. Uh, well, they, they just equa- equated Hamas and ISIS yesterday. And then I believe Hezbollah is starting to hit the north end of, of, uh, of the area from, from uh, Lebanon, right? So <clears throat> the involvement of Russia at this point, other than an academic point, what, how, does Again, that, how does that matter? It's, it's to get the heat off of themselves and to divide that, that money that's going to Ukraine because the, the money that's going to Ukraine, the money in the arms that are going to Ukraine now would ostensibly go to Israel takes the heat off of their their military it's a it's a brilliant strategy when you think about it there there's there's you know 
not much for Russia to lose in this one because you know the the you know as we all see everyone's blaming Iran, everyone's blaming uh, uh, Hamas. I, you know, I get your point with when it comes to ISIS, they're they're all you know kind of this this Sal not Saudi well they're probably is Saudi money but um, they're it's the Sunni uh, militant groups. Uh, Hezbollah is, is Shiite, but um, and yes, they they do pledge to destroy Israel. Um, not so much Judaism. I I don't think the the it's the idea of the of the Jewish state being plopped down in the middle of of their historical lands and we can talk about claims and counterclaims to the lands but um you know i think if if israel was formed in 1948 in you know the deserts of new mexico you wouldn't see the uh, palestinian terrorists going after israel there, there's no reason it's where israel was situated in in this whole um, area of the world so um but to me, it's it's really the the idea is to get the heat off of Vladimir Putin, get the heat off the Russian military, and this divides what it divides Europe. Europe's divided over what to do with this. Half of them backing Gaza, and not Hamas, but Gaza itself. They don't want Gaza destroyed, and then the other half are like, well, we're backing Israel to the to the full hilt. Um, so you're dividing NATO. Um, you've got Erdogan meeting with Putin and, and uh, Raisi, who's a you know, principal NATO member of the control of the Bosphorus. I mean, um, there, there's just a ton of things that really point to Russia having involvement here, but being, it, being far enough away to be able to wash their hands of the situation and say, well, it's a, it's a regional conflict and we hope it doesn't spill over and the United States should you know, not back Israel or uh, should ignore this and, and – you know, knowing full well the United States is not going to ignore it. Matt Miller. But the U.S. has already spent so much in Ukraine. When I heard, you know, the president's speech and, and the declaration of, uh, what, $100 billion, whatever that was, that will now be going out. And then, of course, hearing the breakdown, and there's a lot of money going other places than just to uh, this conflict as well as mm -hmm. what's going on in Ukraine. You know, at, at what point does the U.S. go? Look, what outcomes are we looking for and how much more can we give before we don't have any to give anyway? When it comes to Israel, I don't think that there's going to be a limit. Hmm. Um, Ukraine, there's there's going to eventually be a limit, especially if, you know, really, does, I mean, for us now it is a two-front war. You've got Russia and Ukraine. You've got Israel and Gaza, um, which could expand. Um, I don't, I actually don't, do think that the, the Lebanese and the Jordanians are going to do their darndest to keep Hezbollah out of this conflict. Um, I know the Iranians are pushing for Hezbollah to join the conflict um, because when Hezbollah joins the conflict, Israel takes it out on Lebanon. And they haven't done it on Jordan uh, for a while, but especially Lebanon um, in the Bekaa Valley, the, the, you know, is kind of a Hezbollah stronghold. Um, the, the the Israeli military will take it out on Lebanon, and Lebanon's been blown to smithereens, you know, ever since 1973. So, um, you know, that, that's where it's going to go if it, if it does expand. I I do think that both governments are going to do their darndest to keep Hezbollah out of this and kind of keep them under under heel. I also, <clears throat> Matt, I think it's important not to underestimate the amount of intelligence that we are we are gathering about Russian military capabilities and tactics through the Ukrainian war. Um, there's a lot of, of supposedly, the anticipation of, of Russian technology has been so disappointing for the Russians, and this is all in order to the benefit not only of, of the Ukrainians, but also the United States. It's like what happened in um, Afghanistan in the 70s and 80s, I guess, during that conflict with when Russia was going against our weapon systems in the hands of the Mujahideen. We learned a lot about how really awful the Russian capabilities turn out to be. So beyond just funding the, um, the efforts for Ukraine to gain their liberty, there's also we're hurting Russia, which is, is good for the United States, but we're also gathering a lot of intelligence data. Oh, yeah. David, yeah. Is, uh, Al Rochek posted this uh, in Facebook, and it brings in the country China and whether or not they would have a role in any of this. 
And ultimately, do they are they the ones that really stand to benefit from all this? China is not involved. Um, China China is sitting on the sidelines and watching this. Yeah, they meet with Putin. They meet with uh, they'll meet with anybody. But the thing with China is they're 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 letting the other players beat themselves up. And then they're going to swoop in. Um, you know, they've got this big Belt and Road Initiative that they've been trying to expand their influence throughout. You know, the rest of Asia, rest of um, in, into Africa, um, to play the kind of the, the balanced player in this whole thing. Um, China, um, China wouldn't stand to, other than watching everyone beat themselves up and weaken themselves. I mean, the United States is spending billions of dollars on this thing. Uh, Russia is losing ch- tanks and equipment and people. Um, so basically their their big rivals are killing themselves over these conflicts, um, whether it's financial or actually uh, human cost. And they're, they're chugging along and it allows them to distract from what's going on with their economy. Their economy is in a shambles right now. Um, after, you know, decades of, of massive growth, uh, you know, the um, you're talking about the Chinese economy. Yeah, mm-hmm. the the finance, the the, uh, the ghost cities and and all the construction to nowhere that they've been doing, just to do make work stuff. Um, that uh, is coming to roost right now, it allows them to distract it. Say, oh, look at these shiny wars over here, uh, rather than what's going on. Of course, they control their media, so they get to tell you <laughs> what they what you need, <laughs> what you get to watch. So, mm-hmm. so uh, back to Israel. And uh, Hamas, and Lebanon, and Iran, right? So a month from now, what are we talking about in that region? Is this conflict over, or has it yeah. escalated to the point where it's more like looking at World War Three? Uh, I mean, it could get to that level um, if if there is a clear linkage to Iran, or Iran joins the conflict stupidly. Um, yeah, we could. I mean. If Israel goes after Iran and, and bombs a, you know one of their nuclear plants, uh, just looking at where the, the fallout would go from a nuclear plant bombing, you've got four nuclear powers to the east of, of it, you know, Russia, you've got China d- due east, and then India and Pakistan. So, um, you know, taking out one of their nuclear reactors is not a great play by Israel, but, you know, they've done, they've, they've gone after nuclear um not built nuclear reactors before in Iraq back in the 80s. So, um, and that's been one of their goals is to take out the Iranian nuclear program. Um, and the, let's also not um, ignore the fact that Israel's been making peace with a lot of the Islamic countries, the United Arab Emirates, uh, Qatar, uh, Morocco. Uh, they have all normalized relations in, in the last year, and there's been a real big push for Saudi Arabia. Um, they've been close to normalizing, which would be like a fundamental game changer in the Middle East if Saudi Arabia um, normalizes relations with, with Israel. Um, they won't be on like super buddy friendly terms, but you know, you'll be able to travel between the countries and things like that. Um, but it's the, for the longest time, it was death to Israel, death to Israel from all the, the Middle Eastern countries. And now you're seeing peace with Israel. Um, I think that has some play in what happened uh, on the 7th, that um, to have Israel going into Gaza kind of throws a little bit of a wrench into the, into the Saudi peace deal. Um, to, you know, to pick that fight and then have Israel uh, predictably respond, I think kind of puts a, puts a wrench into that, and we'll see what happens with that, that peace deal. I'm, I'm hoping it does get consummated, but... But hadn't it, on October sixth, the Gaza and Israel were they had open borders, right? They were they there were to an extent. I mean, there's never really open borders, but there were work Israel. permits, and and yeah. there had been normalization. Gaza had sort of been ceded at that point to, uh, well, turns out to be to um, uh, Hamas. That was not the intent originally. So this is a great betrayal. I mean, the October 7th, in addition to being a, a bloodbath in their 9-11, it's also a huge betrayal on the part of, of the Palestinians. To an extent. I mean, uh, the um, Gaza, uh, the, the Hamas took over Gaza from Fatah, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, 
uh, in the early 2000s. The, the Israelis did give back land to Gaza that they, you know, had established some some enclaves in in Gaza. We removed the the settlers out of Gaza, turned that all that whole area over to Gaza, thinking that if got you know if Hamas would provide benefits and and things like that have to do the trash and all the the normal things that a government has to do that they calm down the problem is uh if they if they they made people invest themselves in hamas because hamas was the one that was providing them food shelter uh you know oil or gas whatever um even though it was coming from israel for the for the most part um, but it was under Hamas's name. So they became invested in Hamas. It's not that like they're really keen on Hamas. Hamas is an autocratic dictatorship in, in, in Gaza. Um, it's just that they're the source of their, their livelihoods. And, you know, that. But at the time the land was seen, I could be wrong. I'm getting way out over my skis here. But at the time that Gaza, those areas of Gaza were ceded to the Palestinians, Hamas was not yet in charge, right? They yeah, came no, in after a, that. there was a there was a you know there was an election. There was strife between the West Bank Palestinians and the the Gaza Palestinians, and Hamas, who's more militant than even the PLO, and Fatah, and Fatah the the ruling party of of the West Bank, um, they uh, they they had a little mini civil war, and, and Hamas took over. Okay. David, we're just about out of time. Uh, if you want to take a moment here and kind of summarize the situation and what you see as the dangers and what do you see as possible solutions? Uh, solutions are, are far off at this point, um, un unless everyone just has a moment and says, let's, let's break it off. That's not going to happen. Israel is, is full board. Netanyahu is not going to let that happen. Um, for uh, what could happen, um, pay attention to Lebanon, pay attention to Jordan. If, if you know, Hezbollah joins the fight, then it becomes really bloody. Um, it becomes a regional conflict. Um, if those governments can keep control of it, it's going to take some time for Israel to go through Gaza and, and take out Hamas. And they're never going to be able to take out Hamas. Um, again, what they're doing is, is going to create a new generation of people who hate Israel and, uh, you know, have bloodlust against Israel because of, you know, killing their fathers and their brothers and, and things like that. So, um, but uh, to to effectively weaken Hamas, it's going to take months for Israel to go through Gaza. Gaza is you know, it's you know two million people, and packed into a a very small land area. That's our, and they've all been pushed to the south, so it's even more dense now. Um, so it's it's going to be bloody. It's going to be any, be prepared for bad images. Any thoughts on the college protests? A lot of them have been pro Palestinian. It so it can be pro-Palestinian if you if your goal is to say I don't want Palestinian people to pay the price for what Hamas did because Hamas is its own thing again it's an autocratic dictatorship within Gaza it's its own thing the normal Palestinians were were I wouldn't say happy but they're okay with the status quo of going in and working in Israel and coming back and, and providing for their families. And most people just want to provide for your, for your families. They're not mm -hmm. ideological. So if you're supporting, protecting normal, innocent civilian Palestinians, that's fine. If you're excusing what Hamas did, then no. Um, there is no excuse for what Hamas did. Um, but I will say, um, with every, every time I talk about Iran, Iran is simply doing what any country does. It's trying to expand its power and it's trying to expand its, um, be it the regional hegemon for the Middle East. The United States is doing it. They try to be the regional hegemon. Saudi Arabia is doing it. Israel, uh, to an extent, does it um, just to, for control and security. But um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's where, where I am with, with uh, What's going on in the Middle East? It's 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 a it's a rough thing, but um, hopefully we can find peace in the next couple of years. David, thank you. Thank you, Mr. David Appreciate Valente it. at uh, nine o'clock.